Hello, I'm Heather Anderson. In the article from Monster to Martyr, representing Mary Dyer, Anne Miles first discusses Anne Hutchinson and the antinomian controversy, which cemented Hutchinson as the dominant example of New England religious women's dissent. She then asks the reader to consider the larger narrative of religious women's dissent. The beginning of Mary Dyer's story is intertwined with Anne Hutchinson's story. Mary Dyer would attend the sermons that Anne Hutchinson gave in her home, where Hutchinson openly opposed the authority of the church leaders and claimed that God spoke to everyone, giving each person the capacity to decide what is right and what is wrong. She called out the ministers for straying from the true meaning of the Bible. Salvation was a matter of God's grace and was not dependent on giving alms, praying, attending church, or doing good works. While Hutchinson's eloquence and knowledge of the Bible made her discussion group popular, it also gained the unwanted attention of John Winthrop. Anne Miles goes on to discuss the monstrous births of both Anne Hutchinson and Mary Dyer. John Winthrop describes the monstrous births in his journal. He starts by describing Mary Dyer as a very proper and fair woman, notoriously infected with Miss Hutchinson's errors. He then goes on to describe the baby, who was born around seven months gestation, was ordinary sized, had a face but no head, had four horns, scales, and a navel where the back should be. This description matches with the modern day description of anencephaly and spina bifida. Anencephaly is a malformation of the skull with the absence or partial absence of the brain. The malformation of the head could be seen as horn-like. The details of the baby's back also match spina bifida. This happens when the baby's spine does not completely close. It is easy to see why somebody living in the 17th century would call the baby a monster. Miles draws a connection between Puritans believing giving birth to a monster meant that Mary Dyer and Anne Hutchinson were also monsters, and the monster baby was a sign of God's punishment. After the trial of Anne Hutchinson, Hutchinson was banished and Mary Dyer followed her to Rhode Island. In 1643, Anne Hutchinson was killed in an Indian attack, and her story ends. However, Mary Dyer went on to be center stage in what Miles calls a second chapter. In this second chapter, Mary Dyer goes from monster to martyr. In 1652, Roger Williams, a minister and one of the leaders of the colony, invited Mary and her husband William Dyer to join him on a trip to England. It was on this trip that Mary Dyer becomes a member of the Religious Society of Friends, also known as Quakers. Mary Dyer arrived back in Boston in 1657. In 1658, a third anti-Quaker law was passed, which included that Quakers who entered the colony would be imprisoned, put on trial, and if convicted, would be banished upon pain of death. In 1658, William Robinson and Marmaduke Stevenson, Quaker friends of Mary Dyer, were arrested. Mary Dyer went to Boston to visit them, where she was also arrested. The governor of Massachusetts, John Endicott, sentenced the three Quakers to be hung until they were dead. Governor Endicott met with a Puritan minister to discuss what would happen with Mary Dyer. Endicott decided the political costs of executing a woman would be too much and was worried her death would look like an abuse of power. The life of Mary Dyer was saved for now, but first she needed to experience the chill of death to get some sense in her head. On October 27, 1659, Mary Dyer walked hand in hand with William Robinson and Marmaduke Stevenson on a one-mile journey to the gallows. Robinson was hung first, followed by Stevenson. When it was Mary Dyer's turn, the hangman tied her dress around her legs, put the noose around her neck, and then a cry came out that she had been pardoned. Instead of being relieved, she stood still, saying she was willing to suffer as her brethren did unless they changed the law. Instead, she was pulled down and put back in prison until she could be carried out by force. Dyer later returned to Boston, feeling led by the Lord. This time, she was again arrested, tried, and sentenced to death by hanging. On June 1, 1660, Mary Dyer was led through the streets again. On the scaffold, she was told she could return to Rhode Island and save her life. She responded, Nay, I cannot. For in obedience to the will of the Lord I came, and in his will I abide faithful to the death. 
Miles concludes by suggesting that the stories of Anne Hutchinson and Mary Dyer are best told together. Her statement makes sense. Separately, both stories tell a portion of the antinomian controversy, but together, the stories tell a bigger picture. The story starts with Anne Hutchinson, becomes entwined with Mary Dyer, with both women becoming monsters, and the story ends with Mary Dyer as a martyr for her Quaker faith.